Greetings, salutations. Welcome to this Midday Power Surge, Tuesday, August 11th, 2020. This is your spiritual oasis on this heavenward journey. Before I get into the lesson, two things. I want to welcome Safe to Surf International and first time viewers officially to this Midday Power Surge. Secondly, Today is August 11th, 2020. I'm going to ask for you all to send in some comments, your response, in the comment section of this video, especially if you are a SDA person, believer. All right, friends. Based on the seven trumpets of Revelation chapter 8, Revelation chapter 9, is August 11th significant? All right, it is significant. It's a part of the seventh day Adventist movement's history. All right, two questions. Can you give me the year, August 11th? What is the year where a particularly significant event happened? All right, I'll give you a hint Islam. Muslim, Turkey, I'll give you a hint. All right, friends, please give me that year, August 11th. And before you write in the answer, please do not look at someone else's response. As an SDA person, you should know your history. All right, tell me also what trumpet that date corresponds with. Which of the seven trumpets that date corresponds with, all right? Then tell me, what trumpet are we now under? What woe are we now under? All right, friends, that's your quiz for today. Let's get into this matter. Very, very important. Take a look at this. All right, friends. Some of you have seen this already. August 9, 2020, headline says, Nashville City Councilwoman recommends attempted murder charges for people who are not wearing face masks. I'm not going to give her any time of the day. I'm just showing you, big picture, let's surmise this. I'm simply showing you the radical measures, policies that these individuals are not only contemplating but are willing to put in legislative policies along with penalties. Hmm. Imagine when the calamities become more frequent and more disastrous. Friends, wake up. Let us remain awakened and get others awakened before it is too late. It's time to be prepared. All right, that is here in America. Let's swing over to the Caribbean in the island of Jamaica. Take a look at this. All right, friends. Take a look at this. This headline came out on the 9th of August, 2020. The Jamaica Observer. Headline says, Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness, suggests police will prosecute the pastor. What is he talking about? Prosecuting a pastor for spreading COVID-19. Listen, addressing a virtual press conference last week, Andrew Holness, the Prime Minister, had disclosed that a Jamaican pastor had returned to the island from overseas and spread the COVID-19 virus to a number of his congregants. Now watch this. I'm not going to address that. I wasn't there. You weren't there either. Let's focus on this now. Red word. On Saturday, Holness, the Prime Minister, asserted at a church service here, quote, I am certain that the security forces 
are doing their investigations to bring this matter up for prosecution. So let's prosecute those who are guilty of spreading the virus, the pestilence, infecting others. Now, here's the point. Where did he make this address? At a Saturday church, it said. Is this a Seventh-day Baptist church? A Seventh-day Church of God church? Or is this a Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, look for yourself. It says, Prime Minister Andrew Holness, who was addressing Sabbath church at the Lucy Seventh-day Adventist SDA church in Hanover Western, of course, who was there? You had some member of parliament there. Red words, what did he do while he was there? It's like when Jesus went into the temple. The Bible says in Luke chapter 4, what happened, Christian, in Luke chapter 4, verse 16 onward, what did Christ do? He stood up for to read, thank you, while he was in that synagogue. Well, I'm not making the equi the a parallel here between angel holiness and Jesus. But notice, so he went to the church and listen what he did. Look at this. He read from the book of Romans 13, verses 1 to 7. Let's go there. Romans chapter 13. Now you know what it says. All right, take a look at this, friends. Romans 13, and of course, they're reading from a different version. Verse 1 says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Then it says, if you resist the powers that be, then you will receive damnation. Verse 1 through verse number 7. And those who resist the powers that be, civil authority, you are resisting God. Take a look at this. Red words, he went on to say, Therefore, whoever resists the authority, that's civil authority, resisteth what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment, wholeness, red mercy. I could not forget what Christ did in that temple. We are seeing the anti-Christian power. Now, here's my point. The Pope told us, that COVID-19, this pandemic, is a result of climate change. And what does the Pope say must be enforced to combat climate change? Sunday rests by law. All right. What does great controversy, page 589, page 590, says? Every nation will enact to combat pestilences. It's there on those pages. And calamities, Sunday rest by law. All right. Through whom will the papacy and apostate Protestantism work to get Sunday rest to be enacted as the law of the land with persecution for dissenters, i.e., God's commandment keeping people? For example, again, God's Sabbath keeping people. They will work through the state. Here's my point. Now we are seeing the government telling the churches, you must obey us, our policies to combat pestilences. What should we then expect? Based on prophecy and current events, the government will tell the churches, you must obey Sunday rest by law to combat other pestilences and calamities. Is the point clear? Watch the point. There it is on the screen. What I just referenced. COVID-19, a result of climate change. The Pope said that. Sunday rest by law. The Pope said that. Great controversy, page 589, page 590. Sunday rest to combat calamities and pestilences. With that in mind, look at this now. These are two quotations which confirm the state that will be influenced by the the churches 
apostate Protestant and Popery will quote Romans 13. Look at the second quotation. Just for emphasis, you can pause the video and read the rest. Red words underlined in the middle. Second paragraph, there is a satanic force propelling the Sunday movement, but it is concealed. Let not the commandment keeping people of God be silent at this time. Blue words, there is the prospect, there is the prospect before us. Red words, last sentence, this Bible text will be quoted to us. Us whom? Seventh-day Adventists. What text? Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. Friends, understand this. When Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 13, he did not reference the first four commandments of the ten, the Decalogue. Just the last six, not the first four. Or may I say the first table, two tables. And yet this scripture will be quoted in light of forcing people to honor Sunday rest by law. Is that point clear right there? Romans chapter 13, verse 8 to verse 10. Don't stop at verse 7. Mr. Andrew Holness, Prime Minister, and others, go down to verse 8 and verse 10. He did not reference the first four. You can also read, I'll give you several scriptures. Luke 20, 22 through 26. Second, Matthew 22, 17 through 22. Mark 12, 13 through 17. And don't forget Acts chapter 5, verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. Does it make sense? Look at one more quotation. Great Controversy, page 592. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Red words. Ministers who deny the obligation of God's divine law, will present from the pulpit. Where was Mr. Andrew Holness, the prime minister? In the pulpit of a Sabbath-keeping church. Present from the pulpit the duty, the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. Romans 13, Sister White reference again. And the chapter is entitled in the book, Great Controversy, The Impending Conflict. Let me move on. Question must be asked. If we're bowing now, we will bow then. Does that make sense? Do I need to reiterate? I hope not. Next point. Did Mr. Andrew Holness attend any other denominational church and present the same sentiments as he did at this Seventh-day Adventist church? It's a question. I believe it's reasonable. What do you think safe to serve international and first-time viewers? Secondly, why was he invited to this SDA church? Second, did they know what his message was going to be on that Sabbath? I'm asking the pastors, the pastor, and the elders, deacons of that church. Did they know his purpose? Did they know what his uh, soliloquy was going to be? If so, why did you permit such a message on the Sabbath? It's a question I'm asking. It's a reasonable question to ask. Next question. Why did he choose? If not, why did he choose an SDA church? Is he affiliated with that church? Question. Is the SDA church a prominent church on the island? Is it one off? Or is it the church with the most clout? The largest population, membership on the island. Is this a threat from the prime minister? Does he know that this church has a remnant? 
who do not, who are not reticent, but they are forceful in protesting apostasy and government's unreasonable policies and government's policies that are intrusive and run counter to God's commandments. This is a Protestant church. If I can get this one to bow, I'll get others to bow because this one is very influential. Are these questions reasonable? Next, in closing, Mr. Honus, who describes himself as a man of God, said, he will leave the interpretation of the scriptures to the pastor at the Lucy SDA church. Pause right there. I have to remember Luke chapter 4, and pardon me if I keep repeating that. When Christ read from Luke 4, when Christ read in Luke 4 from Isaiah chapter 61, he closed the book and gave it back to the minister. Verse 20. And what did he say? This scripture today is fulfilled in your ears. And the people was left to interpret it. So much so they grabbed Christ to almost kill Jesus. But his time had not yet come. Come back to the screen. Said he left the interpretation of the scriptures to the pastor of the Lucy SDA church. Is this, was this a threat? He further noted that even the church, the church must follow the authorities and rules that are in place. And during another press conference last week, Prime Minister Holness said that church conferences and conventions would be banned. Friends, look at the juxtaposition. To combat COVID-19, let's ban church gatherings. Watch this. When it's time to combat these pestilences as they become more frequent and more disastrous in connection with calamities, now they will tell us, attend Sunday keeping churches. That's the juxtaposition. All right, friends, I rest my case. It's time to get ready. May I transition now? Are you ready? Now let me add what says 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 3 and verse 4, that just before the second coming of Jesus Christ, just before the mark of the beast will be enforced, what will happen? What must we expect? We will see, we must expect a falling away first. It's going to take place. Again, not only in the world, but also we are among God's professed people. Here's my point as I have been looking at this over and over again. One of the main reasons why many professed Christians, many professed SDA Christians are falling away, it is because the majority of them did not count the cost. Didn't count the cost of what it means to become, to be a Christian. Many of them were baptized. And the pastors who prepared them for baptism did not emphasize and teach them to count the cost. I have been preparing a baptismal class with candidates for baptism. And I have to emphasize to them from God's word to count the cost. Hear me. And the few who were told to count the cost from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. They rejected the message. They acted flippantly. They were apathetic. They didn't take it seriously. They were lukewarm. Here's my point. This is another reason why many baptized SDA now seek to be rebaptized. Because now they are counting the cost. Now, where in the Bible do we find principles that God says these are the requirements to be a Christian? Count the cost. Go to Luke chapter 9, 
Verse 20, I love it, friends. Verse 23 says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and what? And follow me. Counting the cost means, friends, you have to deny yourself daily. Deny yourself daily. Is today a day? Today we must deny ourselves. Have you counted the cost? If you have, you will not fall away. If you have not, you will fall away. I am begging you, parents, pleading with you, young people, count the cost in the book. Faith and works. Listen to what this says. Jesus lays open before you the perils you will meet. The self-denial, that's Luke 9.23. The self-denial that will be required. Required. And Jesus bids you count the cost. Look at the hope now. Count the cost. Assuring you that if you zealously engage in the conflict, divine power will combine with what, friends? With human effort. Count the cost. All right, friends. You must deny yourself. Do you understand the requirements to be a Christian? Look at this. I began to pray because, friends, this is for me. I'm simply sharing the bread God, God gave to me with you. The Bible tells us that we must deny self until we die. Write this scripture down. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10 says, What Christian? Be thou, thank you, be thou faithful. Faith, be thou faithful. Unto death, until when? Death. And you shall receive what? A crown of life. Faithfulness until death. Secondly, faithfulness. Denying self until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Write down Acts chapter 3. Verse 19. Verse 20 says, Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins will be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send you Jesus Christ. Repentance, conversion until the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm going to drive home this point. Do you know some people began the journey? They were baptized. Some people counted the cost when they were baptized. But they thought the journey would have ended already. They thought the second coming of Christ would have become a reality long time ago. And because the journey has extended so much longer than anticipated and expected, they have grown weary. And now they have given in to their carnal lust and sinful desires. This is a great apparent reason why on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, social media, in our homes, in our corporate worship, church buildings, so many adults, pastors not excluded, elders, deacons, women, youth leaders, young people have become backslidden. Don't think too deep on that point. I'm going to come back to that later on. Look at what this says now. Let's turn our Bibles, my friends. Look at this. Upward look, it says, The Lord Jesus does not deceive his soldiers. He opens before them the conflict. He presents to us the plan of the battle. He points out to us the hazardous <laughs> undertaking. He exhorts everyone to count the cost. He does not leave us in ignorance. He tells everyone before enlistment to count 
the cost before they enlist as soldiers in his army for a soldier's life. A Christian's life is a life of duty, a life of self-denial. Count the cost. Enlist. Oh, friends, a life of self-denial. Look at this one more statement. Every soul must count the cost. Not one will succeed, but by strenuous effort, strenuous effort. There it is, my friends. We must spiritually exercise all our powers and crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. Crucifixion means more, much more than many suppose. It is a constant a constant watchfulness to be faithful unto death. There it is, my friends. To fight the good fight of faith until the warfare is ended. And as overcomers, we shall receive the crown of life. I can see my Redeemer, in whom I have fresh encouragement to trust as a never-failing source of strength. This is encouragement, friends. Count the cost. Count the cost. All right, friends. How much more can I shout and emphasize? Is there a scripture that says we must count the cost? Safe to serve international first-time viewers. Do you know that scripture to count the cost? Here it is. Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, the Bible says in verse 27, similar words as Luke 9, 23. Follow Jesus. Take up that cross daily. Deny self daily. And verse number 28 now says, Which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? Whether he have, underscore this, sufficient to finish it, lest people begin to laugh at you, mock you, because you began the journey, but did not finish the journey. Verse 30 saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish the building. Count the cost. It says in verse 29, we must lay the foundation. Write this down. It's a Bible study portion. What is the foundation? The foundation is Jesus Christ. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. The foundation is accepting Jesus. The foundation is confessing your sins accepting Jesus. The foundation is being baptized. Mark chapter 1 verse 4, the baptism of repentance, confessing your sins. That's the foundation. But now watch. Once I lay the foundation, what must we do? What must we do? We must build. Thank you, Christian. We must build. What does it mean to build now? To build means to live a life of departing from iniquity. What scripture says that? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. And then God can seal us. Imagine people are baptized now but will not be sealed. Baptized as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. The Sabbath, the seal, but will not be sealed because they did not depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19. I'm pleading, friends, count the cost, lay the foundation, and build. Have you begun to even lay the foundation, first-time viewers? It's time to accept Christ. Confess your sins. Be baptized and build, pastor. Can I finish the building? Can I really finish and become saved? Yes, you can. Because Christ is your sufficiency. Watch this. Write this down. Luke chapter 14, 28 says, The person failed 
the, it says, we must sit down and count the cost to see if we have sufficient to finish it. Naturally, we are insufficient. We lack. So now, who is our sufficiency? Christ, put this down. Jesus is our sufficiency. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5. Put that down. Second scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Christ is our sufficiency. That's hope. All right. Can I finish the building? Yes. Go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says. And having this, Philippians chapter 1, the Bible says in verse number 6, being confident, being what, Hillary? Being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun the good work, in you will perform it until when will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ that's it my friends that's it count the cost you can finish the building now friends my time is up I don't want to keep you much longer count the cost let me see if I must share with you anymore I won't share with you with you that I'm going to come back and share that piece with you. All right. Must I give you this one? I'll give you this one. Look at this, friends. Christ bids us count the cost of standing under the blood-stained banner. He does not flatter us that we shall have no difficulties in this life. But although we shall be tried, and tempted in meeting the confederacy of evil, yet we are assured that all the heavenly intelligences will be enlisted on our side in how many battles? In every battle. Watch this. But the ministry of heavenly angels will not ensure us against sorrow and trial angels minister to jesus yet their presence did not make christ's his life one of ease oh no nor free jesus from conflict and temptation while we are to engage in the work which the master has appointed us to do we should not be discouraged why? For we know, ah, friends, for we know that one has endured all these temptations that are before us. Friends, Christ bids us, first sentence, to count the cost. I want to ask you a question, friends. Is Christ, is Christ worth your life of self-denial? It's a question. Is salvation worth your life of self-denial? It says, are we willing to pay the price for eternal life? Are we ready to sit down and count the cost? Whether heaven is worth such a sacrifice as to die to self, and let our will be bent. Let our will, desires, be fashioned into perfect conformity with the will of God. Listen, friends. Until we count this cost. Until we live a life of self-denial. Until this shall be the transforming grace of God. Will not be experienced by us. In closing, I say, during the baptismal class for the prospective candidates, after going through a similar lesson, and some of them are even listening now and watching now and will listen hereafter, this was not what I shared with them. It was similar, but this was not it. After I laid out that they were to count the cost 
I then played a song. Have you counted the cost? Now my wife Hillary will sing the song. Listen. And listen, friends, attentively, prayerfully. There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord, where the call of His Spirit is lost. And you hurry along with the pleasure-mad throng. Have you counted, have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? If your soul should be lost, though you gain the whole world for your own, even now it may be that the line you have crossed have you counted, have you counted the cost? Send in your prayer requests. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this midday power surge. We pray even for the leaders here in America. We pray for the conversion of Prime Minister Andrew Holness, his family, the church members, pastors, elders, deacons, there on the island, even uh, the, that Lucy SDA church. We thank you for this message. Oh, dear God, thank you for this sweet salvation. And today, we thank you for the reminder. And today, we say, Lord, from this day forward, by your grace, we will lay the foundation. By your grace, we will build because you will assist. From this day forward, today we count the cost. Lord, we say you are worthy for our life of self-sacrifice. Thank you. Save us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Maranatha.